First of all, I should apologize because uh, I uh, got disappeared for a minute. <laughs> so the actual talk supposed to happen like, yeah, 30 minutes ago. So anyway, we're here. Um, so as I was introduced, um, I'm going to be uh, talking about how to use Python and PostgreSQL to help us about uh, to solve the problems of business logic. Uh, I'm a software engineer. And what I'm going to tell you uh, right now is going to be something that is not trying to convince you to use my solution against ORM, right? Because ORM is always the best choice to have a business logic in your software in one place. So the ORM will be taking decisions, making decisions about how data should be updated, how data should be uh, saved. So it's solid. It's uh, the same always whenever there's an action being taken. But that's the theory. Practice is a little bit different. If you need to work in or any kind of organization, you have a lot of different software. You need to talk to external services. Most of the cases, how you're going to do it is you're going to build the API, right? So you have your application. You have the API, which is exposing data by using any kind of mechanisms like, I don't know, REST API, JSON RPC, XML RPC, whatsoever. It doesn't matter. You're going to build the API. That's the something what I call perfect API. So in Perfect API, this is how it looks like, right? We have a user who is talking to our application, and the user is talking to our, our application through the API or through the um, uh, a web interface. And always, however user interacts with our application, the data on PostgreSQL side is being changed in the same way. Doesn't matter what user is using, API or the website, the data is going to be changed in the same way. That's the theory. In practice, in my experience, I've seen a lot of horrible, horrible solutions which mostly look like this. <clears throat> That's not the worst one, but mostly this is the reality. We have the uh, API, which is like completely isolated, separate software. It doesn't use our awesome ORM, which means the business logic is stored in our awesome app, uh, software, where API is updating data in the database in its own way. And even worse, there are some small, tiny tools you know, flying around, modifying the data in also their own ways, right? So in the end, you, what you can have, you can have this kind of a problem. That the, up, that the whole infrastructure of your, of your application looks like this. You have different modules being used. You have different applications, even words. You have different languages like Ruby, for example, doing something where Ruby doesn't use your ORM, right? Which means PostgreSQL can have problem with consistency of data. Every single application can update the same tables, which means they can damage the data in the end. Because Ruby is going to update data in a different way than Python, or you are putting some patch to your application, which Ruby doesn't know about, and in the end, your table is going to be a little bit damaged. So that's the reality. And probably everybody agrees with it, that this is a big problem. Because if, if the organization is big, we cannot force uh, people to start using our ORM, especially if they use different languages. And there are some kind of cases where there is a legacy software, which we cannot change. We have to deal with it, but we cannot change it. So, the question is how to solve it. My proposal is very simple. If we will try to do something like this, push all of the ORM logic into a database, right? So every single application, every single client, let's call the application client, will be talking to our data, reading and modifying the data in the exact same way. I know it sounds nice, but how to do it? So, after making some kind of a research, I found some very nice solution, which is called PLPython. Um, it's, a, it's a Python which can be used on database side. What it means is you can build your entire business logic by using Python and, of course, Python modules, and they will be running inside of a database. What it essentially means is every single part of the client application is going to be calling the function instead of update some table where something, something. What it means is, by calling the function, the function is responsible for updating the data. So that whole magic happens inside of the function. And every time you call a function, the data will be updated in the same way. Because every single client calls the same function. So the body of the function, if it's going to be changed, every single client doesn't have to do anything. Now, let's talk about PostgreSQL for a minute, what we can uh, use from this database to help us with this kind of a concept. Uh, we can use uh, dynamic types. Dynamic types actually is something what uh, PostgreSQL people call composite types, which means we can create types that don't exist. Like, if I can make a comparison, it's something like a, a structures in C. So you can create something like a table structure, but actually it's not a table, it's just a structure. Um, and of course, we can use functions that I mentioned. 
We can write as many functions as we want, as many functions as we need by using different languages, including uh, Python, including Ruby, including Perl, and pure SQL, of course. Um, and of course, databases can scale, and so on, so on. This is not the part of my talk, so I'm not gonna be diving into this subject. But the best part, which will help us also, are the triggers. Uh, triggers are, I call it the magic. Uh, triggers are uh, uh, some kind of um, magic switches for database, which uh, allow us to react whenever data is being changed. For example, you wanna update data, and you wanna prevent some update from happening if something, something. So instead of having some kind of a logic in your application which does that, you can create a trigger function which will be controlling and shielding your data from the update that you, wanna, that you don't wanna get. So if the user is updating data from PSQL or from Ruby application or from a Python application, the trigger will be always called, and the trigger will check what kind of data user is trying to update. Oh, I don't like this data, so I will not allow you to do it. That's something what trigger can do. It's just a function. Um, of course, what also I like about PostgreSQL, which also I'm suggesting to use, um, uh, this is what I mentioned about uh, composite types, the dynamic types, and a lot of different types that PostgreSQL can, can give you, like floats, uh, decimals, integers, standard types, and um, JSON. JSON is pretty cool uh, in PostgreSQL. Why? Because first of all, PostgreSQL can check the JSON syntax automatically, and second of all, you can treat JSON as regular data, which means you can query for a data, even if it's a J JSON structure. And you can compare data by playing with JSON structures, so it's like being handled by database. You as a programmer don't have to care about it. Database will, uh, will give you a lot of tools to play with the JSON structures. So this is something that we can also use to help us with building business logic in database. What I mean is, for example, if we build up functions which will be returning uh, JSON structures, this JSON structure can be stored in a table. And by having a JSON structure stored in the table, we can query for the data from the table, right? So these are the arrays. I was planning to talk about them. That's something also what PostgreSQL is supporting, but um, I will try to show you some more examples. So this is something what you can check on my website later if you really want to know more about arrays. Uh, this is the composite type that I mentioned. So as you can see, we are defining inventory item, which is a composite type. It's like a structure in, uh, in C, if we can make a comparison. And below, we are using this new item, I mean, I'm sorry, this new uh, type in our table, where the item column is gonna be using uh, inventory item, which is a composite type. I'm not suggesting to use it, because if you try to use it, probably you try to hack something, but there are some cases where you can use it. A very simple example is you can create a function which will be returning a dynamic table. What I mean is the table can be created by a function on the flight. So, the technique which helps you to do that is a composite type. So as you can see, my, I can create a dynamic table which will be having like three columns, name, uh, supplier ID, and price. And the function will be retain, returning roles for this dynamically created table. Where physically the table does not exist in database. Only function will create this table on the flight. I will show you an example what I mean by this later. Um, this is typical uh, structure of the procedural function. This one is actually uh, not written in PL Python. It's a PL, uh, PGSQL. That's just an example. Whatever this function does, doesn't matter. But this is typical uh, structure of the, uh, of the function in PostgreSQL. Um, as you can see, there is some kind of a declaration of the types that we're gonna be using in our function, and, the, and between beginning and the end, we have the actual body, which is doing something. Whatever the something is, this is just an example. Uh, I personally prefer to have some kind of a syntax which looks like this, so it's a little bit cleaner to read it. So as you can see, there's a create function the, the definition. There is a, a below it uh, what we're gonna return. And between those uh, dollar signs, we've got the actual body of the function. It, it's just a syntax, it's just a, a syntactic sugar, that's it. But at least it's a bit easier to read it. Now, uh, I'm gonna show you how to compile Python and PostgreSQL to work together. Of course, you can, you can use, how do you call it? Packaging system to do it. The problem is, this is, what I know from my own experience, the problem is some distributions, some distros are so old that you're gonna get a Python like 2.4, right? So you can use a lot of cool features from Python 2.7 because you have 2.4, which means you probably need to compile your own Python and your own PostgreSQL because your basic distribution is just, just too old. It's very easy, actually. You can compile Python with all of those flags, whatever they mean. I'm not gonna be talking about it because uh, this is something that you can check online and it's irrelevant. So this is how we compile uh, Python. The most important part when you compile Python for, for database is the last flag. 
enable shared. Remember about it, because if you forget about this flag, you will not be able to use Python that you just compiled with PostgreSQL. Um, once we compile it, we have probably this problem. It's very easy to solve it. We just need to tell uh, Linux to use a new path from our newly created Python, which we compiled under opt -py. So if Python tries to start, it will be looking for libraries under opt -py lib. It's, I guess, pretty uh, obvious. Mm. Now we need to compile PostgreSQL. And as you can see in this uh, configure state statement, we are compiling PostgreSQL uh, under directory opt -pgsql with Python support and Python that we just compiled, which is under opt -py, right? And we have to compile it. Once it's done, we cannot forget about compiling plugins. One of them is PLPython, which is under contrib directory. That's our next step. And after that, ta-da, database can be created. We can initialize database with command inedb, and database will be starting. We can create new data, new databases with specified encoding. And for for my talk, I'm, I'm going to be using data database called Py. Uh, that's just an example, of course. And um, create language. That's a syntax. What, what, that's a that's a command that we're going to use to create our Python support on, on PostgreSQL side. It tells PostgreSQL to use additional language, which will allow us to create PL Python functions. So as you can see uh, in, the, in the example below, the last one, <coughs> the very last one, uh, we have two extensions in our, in our database. One of them is PL Python U, why U? Because some people call it untrusted. <laughs> um, yeah, where the Python is a pretty mature language. Um, anyway, that's my conclusion. If those two simple steps to compile Python and PostgreSQL didn't work, probably what you try to do is uh, one of two cases. What you try to do, is never ever anybody will try to do before, or you try to do something stupid. <laughs> because it's like very simple. Um, anyway, let's start with PLPy. That's something what I, I, I came here to talk about. So I'm going to show you how to write PLPython functions. Actually, it's pretty simple. It's kind of the same as PGSQL. The difference is we don't have a declare syntax. We don't have a body and end. Between those uh, dollar signs, we have a pure Python code, which means all the indentations, all the modules that we're going to use is going to be Python. Uh, I, allow, I allowed myself in this example to show you how to print out Hello World message. So uh, let's see if it works. That's going to be an example if it works. So, I created, oh, yeah. hmm. let me put mic down, sorry. Okay, so I just create the function, hello world, All right, that's our function, and let's try to call it. As you can see, it's, it's, the way we call the function is the same as like selecting uh, data from a table. No difference here. It's pretty simple, straightforward. Oh, sorry. Um, there we go. That's the result. Why nothing is being returned? Because we told the function to not return a single thing, right? It returns void, nothing. But where's the hello world message? And here comes the difference. If you want to print out anything in PL Python, you cannot use print state uh, syntax. You cannot use logger, and you cannot use print. The way you print stuff is to use a special variable, which is called plpy, which contains, um, how do we call it? It's a, it's a hook to database connection. It, it allows you to print messages, make queries, and play with some PostgreSQL functionalities. And this is how you print out hello world as an info message. Of course, you can print out error messages, warning messages, debug messages, and so on, so on. So depending on the database configuration, you can hide some messages or show some messages depending what you want to achieve. That's a very simple example. And if we're going to, if you will try to execute this one, let's see what's going to happen. And let's execute the same function. And there we go. Info, hello world. Now, let's talk about for a second for, about the triggers. What is the trigger in PostgreSQL? As I mentioned, it's a, it's, a, it's a kind of a magic which allows you to call a function upon data change. Whenever data is being changed, the trigger will fire a function. 
That's why it's called trigger, because it fires an action or a function. And uh, the trigger can be called before the data is being changed or after, upon insert, update, or delete. So as you can imagine, you can react with your functions when data is being changed, whenever it's being updated, deleted, or inserted. It's up to you to decide what to do with the data and how to react. So the trigger gives you this kind of a power that you can run a specific type of a function, function or functions, because you can run many functions, uh, depending when it should happen. And of course, the PostgreSQL, PostgreSQL, you can also say that I want to fire some triggers when there are some conditions happening, being matched. So PostgreSQL can be smart enough to see that if some specific data is being updated, no trigger actions are taken. So this is something that we're going to very, very much use for our business logic. Because as I mentioned before, we want to have um, entire business logic working on database side, which means we need to react whenever any kind of data on, on any kind of a table is being changed. We know when we want to react. We know how we want to react. We know what we should do with it. For example, if you have a table with bills, right? And the table has got a foreign key to users. And somebody's accidentally removing a user. What's going to happen with your bill table? You're going to lose you know, all the bills because somebody just deleted the, the user accidentally? No, you don't want to have that. So this is where the trigger can help you. Before delete, trigger will check if you can remove the data that you are trying to remove. And that's something what I'm going to show you how to do. Now let's see some action. Um, I'm going to show you an example database that I prepared. And I'm going to show you how to use the triggers and functions with the database and, of course, the Python. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to put the mic down. I hope you can hear me. <coughs> uh, so that's our database. I created I a created few tables, very simple tables, like bill. Table where I have my bills, bill item, which contains the item, items that I sold. It's a, some kind of a website where, I, where I'm se selling some stuff. And I have a table with clients. I have table with items that I'm offering on my website. So as we will check, <coughs> I have some example products. And now, let's imagine a situation that I want to sell those products, which means I, I want to create a bill right, with the specific types of product that I just sold, and of course the quantity. Uh, but I don't want to use insert syntax. I don't want to use any kind of a syntax like insert into and something something. I want to have a function, which I said the function can be a PostgreSQL function. So we can create such a function. It's very simple. I created such a function called sell item. And there we go. I hope you can read it. Let's make it a little bit smaller. Can you still, still see it? Oh, sorry. Ah. OK, that's a function, right? It takes three arguments, which is user email, right? Shop code, any kind of a varchar code for the shop that you will uh, be able to use for the ident identification which shop was selling the item. And this is interesting. Article codes. This is a text. So what I was thinking about why should I create a function which, which will be taking like millions of trillions of arguments as items, uh, a list of items. I decided to pass a JSON structure. Simple, easy to follow, and really easy to read, which I'm going to decode here. It's a one argument, and it's a JSON structure. So my Python function is importing JSON object, as you can see here. And it's decoding the list of items that I'm selling. And it's making some kind of a queries, checking if the client exists that I gave as an argument. It's inserting bill and, inserting and selling the items with corresponding uh, quantity, as you can see. So this is just an example how you can uh, do what you will probably do in ORM by making few queries, checking data, looping, whatsoever. This is the exact same thing, but, but, but the magic is it happens on database side. So from whatever I'm going to call this function is going to work identical in the same way. And in the end, the function will return JSON. Why JSON? Because in the definition of the function, I said I want to return text. So text is JSON, right? It's just a text. So I'm going to show you an example how it works and what it does. But this is an example which, which I prepared. Let me find it. Yeah. So that's my function. And as I told you just a minute ago, first argument is the user email. Second argument is the shop code, some kind of a code for, them, for my 
shop. And the third argument is a J JSON structure. As you can see, it's a JSON dictionary. Very simple structure. Nothing. Of, of course, it can be complex. That depends what you want to achieve. But in this example, it's really simple. The first key, I mean, the key is the uh, hash of the product that I'm trying to sell. The value is the number, the quantity of the product that, that, that I'm trying to sell. So let's run it. Boom. Done. The function is returning, as I said, JSON structure. And it, tel and it tells me which build ID was created. Status is true. I sold the products. Now, uh, what you are thinking probably, why JSON? Uh, for a very simple reason. This JSON can be returned with, without doing anything at all to the browser directly. Or even better, by using JSON uh, types, it can be stored in database. So database will check the syntax, database will store the data, and then I can query for the data by using PostgreSQL. So let's check if actually the, the items were sold. There we go. We sold the item. I mean, we created a build. And let's check how many items do we sell. There we go. These are the items that we sold. So this is what we wanted. The function does, does that. We are happy. It works the same way. It doesn't matter where we are calling this function, because the syntax is going to be used the same way everywhere. So it's really hard to make a mistake. Right now, imagine if you want to try to play with, I don't know, discounts. What you need to do is you just need to change the body of the function. You don't need to change anything on the client side, because the client is going to be calling the function in, in the same way, which is this. So internally, you can query for additional data, check the discounts, give the discount, same, save different price for each item, et cetera, et cetera. So which means it's very convenient for the application to call the function instead of playing with the discounts on the ORM side. Of course, the ORM is better, because at least uh, you don't have to use all of those select asterisk from. But yeah, not every part of your, of your, of your organization is going to use your ORM, right? So that's one magic. <clears throat> Let me show you um, how we can create a trigger. Because we just sold something, right? And I created a trigger, which will prevent me from deleting a user if the user is associated with the bill, right? So this is my trigger. It looks like this. It's very simple. It's the same syntax as the previous function. The only difference is I'm telling PostgreSQL that, that this function returns trigger. Trigger is using a special object called, uh, called uh, TD. I'm sorry, this function is in PLPGSQL, by the way. Sorry for confusion. Um, so I can mix PLPGSQL and PLPy in the same time. It's not a problem. I mean, I can create some functions in PLPGSQL and some functions in PLPython. So this function, for example, is uh, checking uh, if there is such a client uh, uh, being used for the bills, one of the bills. If so, I am printing out the warning and preventing from deleting. So if I'm going to be trying to, to delete user, <sighs> client, see, I see a warning message. And I deleted only one user. So let's check if it's true. I had two users before. There we go. The user John DX still exists. So my Ruby application did not delete this user because user was related to, to a bills. He was used for selling something, right? So I cannot delete this user. I'm preventing my own data from from, from uh, data disappearing. Data will not disappear accidentally because this is what trigger stopped me from, from doing. Another thing is, let's imagine we have an application which is using uh, Redis. We want to store something in Redis automatically. In most cases, probably we're going to build some kind of a watchdog, which will do that. Check database, update Redis cache with some values. How about doing this magically, automatically with triggers? Because we know when we insert data, we know when we delete data, we know when we update data. So how about using a trigger to push the data from database to Redis automatically? No problem. Let's, uh, let's check a function which, which I created. <coughs> this is the function. It's written in PL Python. As you can see, it's using Redis module. So that's the module what I installed in my Python that I previously compiled. And I'm connecting to Redis and I'm checking the incoming data from the trigger. You probably noticed this spe special variable. This variable is a global variable being used by PLPython. It will store uh, some, some uh, data from the table, like uh, new means this is after update, or after insert, or after delete. 
if it's being called old, like this, the trigger is being called after data was removed, so, and old value will contain data before the change. New will contain data after the change. So also I can make some kind of a comparisons. How data looked like before the update and how data looked like after the update. So anyway, this is, the, this is a very, very trivial example. Whenever I'm creating a bill, I'm going to be pickling uh, the entire bill into the Redis cache. So let's see if it works. So if we check the table bills, as you can see, there is a trigger being installed, the one that I just showed you. And upon insert, it should, it's supposed to be called. And it should do what I ask him to do, which means pickle data into the Redis cache. So let's check Redis. <laughs> there we go. If you don't believe me that it works, I can delete data, update again, and you will see the data is back. This is, this is how the whole business logic can be, can be um, written in Python. All of those functions that we create, we can store them very easily in database. They are, now, probably you are thinking, how about memory leaks? How about the Python itself? How about the execution? Uh, that's something what is like worth of exploring, because every single function that I'm calling is going to be uh, creating an individual standalone Python interpreter. So after the function is finished, the interpreter is gone. right? But you can change that. You can tell PostgreSQL to have different types of functions, different, different way of using them. So that's something you can check in, the, check in the documentation. But anyway, you have to be careful if you use PL Python functions. Definitely, if you write functions like this, whenever there is loop involved, be careful. Uh, for a very simple reason, because if you are storing too much data in Python, uh, the, mem the, mem the memory footprint for database itself is going to be enormous. And at some point of time, if you are using a lot of shared buffers to cache data in memory from PostgreSQL, you can actually break your, your, your machine because it will eat up the entire uh, memory and suddenly you, you realize that, whoops, your machine is not accessible anymore. Because probably the function you called was consuming so much memory that it would just break, break the entire PC. So that's definitely something that you have to care, be careful about. Anything else, you can use any kind of a tool from Python that you can, you can install. You can use, as you probably noticed, I'm, gonna, I'm using here CJSON, which is a C Python extension. So there is no problem to use uh, any kind of a module. It can be even Cypher modules. That's completely up to you. It's a pure Python. You are controlling it. Uh, the only side effect of using this kind of a concept of business logic, in my personal opinion, is if you want to be uh, able to test those functions. That's a challenge, because you cannot run this code directly with using Python interpreter. Because as you can see, it uses some special, uh, special uh, hooks, like this one, for example, PFI. It does not exist in Python. So you have to mock it, or you have to create some kind of actual connection to database, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, I'm not saying it's not doable, but it's definitely a little bit complex. So yeah. Of course, we can create, I, I almost forgot. That's a very, very important part. I was telling you a few minutes ago about uh, dynamic types, the, the composite types. And this is something what I actually, oh, sorry, this is another one. Um, Oh, yeah, that's the one. That's the one. Uh, yeah, I think that's the one. Shoot. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, oh, one second. Um, yes. That's the function which is playing with the composite types. So as I told you, you can create a composite type, right? So it's like a dynamic table. And this is actually how you do it. You can either create a composite type on database side and tell, hey, PostgreSQL, this is my new type which I'm going to be using to return values from my functions. Or you can create a composite type on a flight like this, which means if I want to be returning additional uh, uh, col column, I would, I would do something simple as, as this, out something something integer. I don't have to create a specific composite type on database side. I can do it inside of the function. This is something that was introduced in PostgreSQL 9.2, if I'm not mistaken. But this is very, very, very nice thing. How it works, actually, is something what I can show you. <laughs> let's put this function into database. And let's run it. So this is the function. Mm -hmm. Let me check the body. Um, oops. 
select oh I have to choose something I have to build a bill 20 okay from mm, logic so arguments of the functions are I need a bill number ID and I need a discount this function is just a, just an example it gives me some kind of a discount based on the what, what I bought whatever I just want to show you how it can return dynamic ta dynamic tables. So uh, I need a, a bill ID and I need a discount percentage. So bill ID was like should I 20. Let's get some discount. Discount. Ta-da! This is what it does. As you can see, it's a table, which means I can use this table with the function to create views, and I can query for it. I can do. I can use something like this, where. Let's call it again. See what's the result. Let's say let, well the. Where bill number is 20, or let's say 3. Oops, sorry. Uh, numbers, uh, whatever. Anyway, this is how we can use it. Uh, and yeah. I'm not going to be show you, showing you some kind of a very complex example of the entire business logic that you can build with this concept. But as probably you notice, I am using schemas. My schema is called logic. I am creating functions, triggers inside of the schema. I can create many schemas. I can create many tables. And the whole thing is being controlled by PostgreSQL. <coughs> so that's, uh, that's about it. That's what I wanted to show you. Uh, probably you want to know more. The subject is like so broad that I can be standing here and talking for about the next eight hours, I guess, if you want. <laughs> But if you are hungry for more, you can always check, check my website, check the Stack Overflow, Google. There are tons of information and examples. The only problem with this concept is if you have a problem with PL Python, some kind of a problem, whatever it is, it's not that easy to find an answer in the internet because this is not like popular concept of using PostgreSQL. I'm not saying it doesn't exist. I built like two successful projects with that, commercial projects. So I'm kind of an example that, yeah, there are some people who use, use those kind of things. But yeah, if you're keen, just contact me and I will try my best to help you. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Yeah. Okay. okay, I'm saved. Okay. Yeah, quick question. You just mentioned that every, every time you trigger, you, you actually create a whole Python environment just to hold something? Yes. Yes, that's correct. Which means, logically speaking, um, you have to be careful how complex your function is. I'm not talking about, you know, what do you want to achieve? The function can be doing a lot of magic. The only thing what you, supposed to be for you, uh, very important, is the memory footprint, right? Because if you have a powerful monster machine with 64 gig of RAM, God knows how many cores or whatsoever, probably you don't care that much, as much as you care if you have a machine with four cores, for example, and two gig of RAM. Right? So you need to try to create those trigger functions to be as light as possible, in some cases. Definitely it's going to be creating some serious memory footprint. Yes? Do you find uh, Python can very poor, so it can be faster, it will be PTSD, it will be... Honestly speaking, I'm... The, the, okay, let me rephrase the question a little bit. The only reason why I'm using PL Python instead of PGSQL, right? It's very simple. With Python, I can be playing with Redis. I can be playing with Mongo. I can be playing with some other cool things that I cannot use under PGSQL, PLPGSQL, where actually, unfortunately, PLPGSQL is much faster. Much faster, definitely. Is it possible to use PyPy? Uh, it's possible to use PyPy. It's, I'm, I will not give you a straight answer how to do it, but it's possible even to mix Python 2 and 3 as an extension for the same database. Google, Google for it. <laughs> yes? Uh, would you have security issues by introducing a Python interpreter within Postgres? Uh, that's a good question. Um, definitely, maybe this, this is some, something that is kind of a naive on my side. Um, I'm assuming, which is, as I said, naive, the database is running in, in some kind of encapsulized system. So I am controlling the database. It's completely closed and is encapsulized. There is no external access to it. The only access is through my API or through my application. So I'm trying to shield my database on my application instead of database side. 
But definitely, definitely, this is this is the risk. This is the this is the powerful language. I mean, Python. If it runs on the database side, you can do a lot of nasty things if you expose some functionalities directly to uh, to the user. For instance, you can use light HTTPD with with a hook to PostgreSQL. You can be exposing websites from PostgreSQL directly as queries. So there is no Django running, no nothing, right? You can do that. But if you mix this concept with PL Python, it's scary. Yes. Does the internal Python uh, actually, mm -hmm. I mean, actually, the way you interact with database is you use those PLPy uh, hooks. So this is like a like a connection which is created each time you call the PLPython function. So it always exists inside of your Python function. So this is how you interact with PostgreSQL. You don't connect to the PostgreSQL. So by, think, by thinking for a second, you cannot use ORM from PLPython function. It's very, it's very tricky because if you want to use ORM like Django ORM, you need to create settings, you need to connect to database where the connection actually is already established because you're running on the database side. So it's, it's going to be like reconnecting to the same database, right? So in, in some of your, your functions, you have a select from builds where user equals. Mm -hmm. Like You mean this? Uh, oh, it's, uh, it's difficult to talk when I have the microphone. Um, this one? This one? Um, so, so, so you had a previous function you showed which had a potential for an SQL injection. Oh! <laughs> okay, um, to, to justify, um, these were just examples. Don't try to follow those examples as they are like rock solid, they are like don't have any holes or something. These were just examples to help to show you the concept. So if there is any SQL injection thing inside, uh, nah, culpa, my fault. <laughs> it does allow you to use like placeholder in your SQL statements. Yes. It's, it's, it's SQL. So you, if, you, if you have any kind of a potential risk, any kind of a potential hole as SQL injection, it can happen. So you need to escape queries, for example. You have to do it. Okay, thank you then. I hope you liked it.